her policy. <laughs> How can she be held to account when she's not in charge? Calls for her resignation come two days after newly appointed Treasury Chief Jeremy Hunt ripped up the tax-cutting package unveiled by Trust's government less than a month ago. It included... Hello, everybody on YouTube. This is Mitch Jezerich with Katrina Vanden Heuvel, and we will be doing a live broadcast of our upcoming chat about Ukraine. So stay tuned for that right after the news. A bombing near the front gate at Myanmar's main prison for political prisoners has killed at least eight people today. The military confirmed five visitors, including a 10-year-old girl and three prison staff, were killed. Thirteen visitors and five prison personnel were injured in two blasts. A little-known anti-government group claimed responsibility. Myanmar has been in turmoil since the military seized power from the government of Aung San Suu Kyi last year. Immigrant rights advocates in the U.S. are calling for the release of migrants detained after surviving a mass shooting in the Texas desert by two brothers who worked in law enforcement. One migrant is dead, another is wounded, and at least seven others are languishing in detention three weeks after the twin brothers allegedly opened fire on them, claiming they thought they were firing on wild pigs. Advocates are signing a 2021 directive that specifies being a victim of a crime in the U.S. should be considered during immigration enforcement actions. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for Pacifica Radio. Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. After Russia's invaded invasion of Ukraine in late February began, we did a series of conversations with people on the left concerning their views about the war, including their views about the United States' involvement in the war. Eight months later, tens of billions of dollars spent by the United States and other Western powers in military aid and mass devastation throughout Ukraine with no end in sight. We once again return to these kind of conversations. It's an issue that has divided the left. Now, tomorrow we'll be joined by Zakhar Popovich. He is a member of the left opposition in Ukraine. He supports military aid to Ukraine to fight against Russia's invasion. Today, we are joined by Katrina Vanden Heuvel who is calling on the United States to immediately ease tension in the war and find diplomatic solutions to the crisis. Now, what will be different this time in our series of conversations is we will be taking listener calls. I know many of you feel strongly about these issues. The phone number to call, now you can only call if you're listening to us live on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, or KFCF uh, in Fresno, or if you're listening to us on the inter, uh, internet. If you're not listening to us live, regrettably, we won't be able to take your call. But if you are listening to us live, the number to call is 1-800-958-9008. Again, that's 1-800-958-9008. We're also doing a live video stream on our YouTube page where you can leave comments and questions there as well. Just find us on YouTube, look for Letters and Politics, find our page, and you will see our stream. Again, we are joined by Katrina Vanden Heuvel. She has been covering Russia-U.S. relations for many decades now. She is editorial director and publisher of The Nation magazine. She is also with the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord, and she also writes a weekly column for The Washington Post. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you for having me on. And I think it's very wise to have different points of view because the left is not united. And um, your next guest sounds like an important voice. T tell me about that left not being uh, united and, and sort of division this left. You, again, you're the publisher of The Nation magazine, a very important voice on the left. So, you know, look, I've come to this, Mitch, as you noted, having visited Russia since, worked in Russia really since 85. I first went in 78 and then 80, 81, 82 with my late husband, Stephen Cohen. We couldn't get visas from 82 to 85 individually or together. A week after Gorbachev, who passed about a month ago, came to power, we did get a visa. I've seen through time, and obviously we want to talk about Ukraine, but the ascendancy of war parties in both countries, the United States and Russia, the expansion of NATO, which I think was a great disaster uh, coming in 1989-91, the expansion of NATO, which there was a debate about in this country. And there were voices, eminent voices, who worried what that would mean. 
But the war parties, I've just been editing in the last hour a piece by my longtime friend Boris Kagerlitsky talking about the Russian left, uh, which I don't think is divided. The left in Russia has been deeply opposed to this war. Um, in this country, I think there's, um, where I come into this is more rooted in history than I think some of the opposition, but the idea of defining and redefining security, Mitch, I think is a key question. And with COVID and the pandemic, this was a few years ago, the hope that we might redefine security as less of a military framework and more about dealing with climate and pandemics and nuclear proliferation. That has passed and I'm concerned deeply and I suspect even those who support arming Ukraine understand that the militarization of security is not in the best interest of any country as we look out at the world with hunger, security, energy problems, crises, roiling the world. Militarization, military might is um, at best a short term. It's not going to resolve the crisis of Ukraine. And we're now at a moment, Mitch, proxy war essentially between the United States and Russia, which is why I wrote the other day, and so many have on the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that those lessons are urgently needed. We are closer now to nuclear conflict than at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis which is not about security. It's about staggering insecurity. What do you think the United States should do right now? What are you advocating for? I advocate for beginning of back channels at a minimum, that there's talking underway, that the United States be involved, but that other countries. We know, Mitch, that there have been several efforts since the disastrous war launched by Russia and Putin. For example, in March, uh, former National Security, I'm, she was in the National Security Council, Fiona Hill, scholar Angela Stent, reported on attempts to uh, negotiate some kind of ceasefire between Zelensky and I believe the Turkish leader was involved and Boris Johnson, then the British prime minister, flew to Ukraine. We don't know exactly what he said, but any attempt, even in these angry, days to launch a back channel seems important on the road to a ceasefire. Obviously, every day there's more anger, hatred, and the need to, we've seen in different circumstances over decades that there are comparable situations, whether it's a nuclear situation or the Northern Ireland crisis, for example, where you can begin to still the crisis on the road to a ceasefire, on the road to some negotiated solution. At some point, Mitch, this war is going to end. And let me just you know, point out that the Soviets were in Afghanistan, we were in Afghanistan, we withdrew. We don't have a great track record of reconstruction. We poured trillions into 20 years or more of Afghanistan, but we come out and the international community can barely pony up 5.5 billion for the reconstruction of a country, which we com were complicit in the destruction of. So I think that road to reconstruction needs to begin soon. And the key is that Ukraine remain an independent sovereign country. And I believe that if there's a will, there's a way. And we've seen before resolution of crises, this obviously could es escalate. I will say that um, people in Europe are reeling and already facing a winner with these stores closing, energy costs rising. That should not be the basis, but it's a, you know, leads toward how do we begin? How do we begin to uh, find a resolution? It does seem like this is a critical time. Winter is coming. It gets very I mean, cold in Ukraine. We know that- What is the off ramp, Mitch? That's the question, because if it's continuing to fund, and I know, you know, hundred, Hundred billion, I think, has been taken into brought into Ukraine and different. There's also the advising of Ukraine. There is the ongoing proxyization of this war, so that in Russia, by the way, the administ the regime is able to present this as a battle against NATO and the West, which has more potency than a battle war against Ukraine in the context of so many Russians have family or intermarried Ukraine. Uh, 
the closeness. So um, the ability to find an off ramp is sounds cool and cold blooded, but it's real in the context of more escalation, military escalation. What is that going to bring? More death leading to possible nuclear escalation. And we haven't talked about Putin. I've always felt as a journalist in these last 20 years, the fact that so much of the coverage of Russia has been Putin, Putin, is the, you know, in this country, we tend to person, pers you know, personify uh, countries. And, you know, what I think is important and the U American Committee on US-Russia Accord, which I'm involved with, you mentioned, has a uh, scholar, Marlene Laruel, who's an expert on the Russian nationalist right. That is the major force in Russia right now, it's a war party. It is pushing Putin, who is part of this party as well, but has other referee qualities, is pushing Putin to be tougher, to take the gloves off, to move in more aggressively. So in both countries, I think the military, the hawks, ascend in times like this so that there are cooler heads without losing sight of the staggering brutality and barbarism of this war that are needed to resolve toward a ceasefire. About Putin, you've again, you've covered Russia for a, a very long time. In the past, Putin has been always seen kind of, well, it kind of goes back and forth a little bit, but for a while now is an adversarial figure to the United States, but somebody who is still rational. Now he's oftentimes portrayed as being somebody who's not so rational. What is your take on Vladimir Putin and our perception Again, I, I, t I take to history. Um, when Yeltsin, and it's interesting to me that Boris Yeltsin, who was a favorite of the Clinton administration, is rarely mentioned. It's an important segue between Gorbachev into Putin. Putin's first act in power was to give Yeltsin and his family immunity from corruption uh, trial. Uh, when Putin came to power, the nation was worried about authoritarian tendencies. The Wall Street Journal and New York Times thought he was Yeltsin without the drinking. Um, 24 years in power. Chechnya, the second war in Chechnya, Yeltsin launched the first is a small template of what we're witnessing in Ukraine in terms of the barbarism of methods, but also very important, the demoralized troops, the troops without adequate equipment or training. That was a highlight of Chechnya on a smaller scale. And then, you know, Putin gave a speech at the Munich Security Conference, I think it was 2007, the height of Iraq war, where he said, this is no longer a unipolar world, which is in reality the case. But Angela Merkel and McCain and Lieberman sitting in the front row were horrified. And McCain comes back to the United States and says, Russia is no longer on its knees. This is dangerous. And I think in that, certainly Putin's actions, but in that became a demonization of Putin, which has played well because to demonize is to lay the groundwork for ongoing conflict and adversarial relations. And I have to say, as we sit here facing possibly the first nuclear danger since the Cuban Missile Crisis. The United States, thanks John Bolton, withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, then Trump withdrew from Open Skies, Obama kind of did a small start nuclear deal, but the scaffolding of nuclear arms control agreements has been shredded mostly by the United States. So then I come back to NATO. You know, there was, a, I'll stop here, but there was a deal on offer which Putin was a part of called the Minsk Agreement. This was 215, 2016, which was Germany, France, uh, Russia, Ukraine. And there were deals, there was a framework in, on offer where Ukraine would be free and sovereign and there would be agreements. Uh, some dis, dis, dismiss it, some dislike it, some think it was a sellout, but it was on offer. And Putin at this point, I think, there's a lot of talk, Mitch, about after Putin. It's possible. I think he's lost the legitimacy, not since he increased, he lowered the pension age and cut pension payments in 2018. Has he been as unpopular inside Russia because of his mobilization? And uh, I think he fought, he didn't want the mobilization of war because now the country is keenly aware 
boys are coming back in zinc coffins again as they did in Afghanistan, and people around the country are beginning to protest. As in our country, the working class, low-income people get hit the hardest. But Putin now, I think, is consigned to history as this is the greatest strategic blunder. He's lost legitimacy. It's unclear what's going to happen inside the country, but certainly 24 years in power is a long, long time, and the need to find succession will be on the minds of many. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Katrina Vanden Heuvel, who has been covering Russia-U.S. relations for many years now. She is the editorial director and publisher of The Nation magazine. She also has a foreword or a prologue in Medea Benjamin's new book concerning the war in Ukraine. Again, we are taking listener comments and questions in this hour. The phone number is one 800 958 We are also live streaming our conversation on our YouTube page. Look for Letters and Politics there. You can even leave a comment or question there that I can read on air. Just for, look for Letters and Politics on YouTube. When we began our chat, Katrina, I forgot to make that our link public, but it, it but I did pretty early on. So it is public. So if you went there at the very early stages of our chat, go back there. It is public now. Katrina, Van- I, wanted yeah. to, I, I wanted to just say one thing. It's critical that you're exploring views on the left, but the failure of our media system in terms of coverage of war and peace, you know, we don't get a range on our screens, pixels or screens that the militarization of coverage. I think of the press briefings at the White House where there are questions about how much more aid, how much more aid, military equipment, uh, or the generals and military people who have investments in the companies that are gonna make out like bandits. Um, We deserve better, we deserve a debate about um, how to find a way forward that's not more war. Certainly the coverage of the Ukraine war in the first month or two was staggering in its uh, comprehensiveness, which I think was important. I think if people see war, maybe there's more resistance to the smooth rolling out of military equipment. It would be good to see more war. I mean, we don't want more war, but if there's going to be war, people should see it. And we did with Ukraine. Now it's off the screens. It's really not on the radar fully politically as we enter the midterms, different issue. I think, um, but the media is doing a disservice with the range of people, uh, essentially representing the Mickey Mac, as Ray McGovern calls it. It's no longer the military industrial complex. It's the congressional internet, other complex. And I think there's a much wider range of views in this country, not just on the left, but among this country, in this country, and in other countries. What is your take about what's happening on Capitol Hill and in Washington in general? We spent tens of billions of dollars in military aid to Ukraine, largely supported, mostly supported, maybe unanimously supported up to this point by Democrats. We have heard some progressive lawmakers start to question the accountability of doing this, but still yeah. vote for it. Most of the opposition and not a majority of Republicans, but mostly opposition, we get to this, are, are, is coming from Republicans. for Very sending, little. Yeah. Well, as you know, Mitch, the one big bipartisan sort of support, the bipartisan issue, with the de, I don't call it the defense budget, the war budget has bipartisan support. And in fact, the Congress poured more money into what Biden requested. You know, I think um, the Russia issue has become even more difficult for democratic progressive Congress people because of Putin. And, uh, you know, we're not going to talk about it, but Russiagate, the view that Putin was Trump and Trump was Putin uh, played big out of Hillary Clinton's campaign into this moment. We're still grappling with the Steele dossier, which is being revealed clearly as a fraud. But the demonization of Putin lays the groundwork for a belief that he's the incarnation of all evil it's more complicated. He's, you know, not, it's not black and white, it's gray, black and white. Uh, I think it's a, d- a danger that it's been so, quote, bipartisan, the support. We are seeing the beginning of a letter on Capitol Hill led by Pramila Jayapal, Rokana, others, 
essentially seeking diplomacy, an escalation of diplomacy, not weapons, and uh, finding a way toward uh, off-ramp. But it's small. Uh, people who've organized the letter say it's never seen as tough a uphill struggle to get more signatories. So uh, I think it's a disconnect, Mitch. I've seen a disconnect between the inside the beltway, not just the kind of establishment blob, but also progressives and the rest of the country. I don't believe this country's isolationist, but I believe this country is interested in engaging the world in, uh, with restraint, engage a different kind of engagement. I've been involved with the Quincy Institute. I recommend it to those listening to check it out, Andrew Basevich, others who see an alternative to the interventionist kind of liberal interventionism and certainly the neocon interventionism. And there's a tradition in this country which is worth recalling. So the guest we're going to have on tomorrow with the left opposition in Ukraine, Zakhar Popovich, writes this, quote, The left and internationalist must learn that an anti-imperialist front is impossible without armed resistance. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is currently the most impudent and cynical imperialist attack in the world. Behind the criticism of arms supplies to Ukraine is the ill-conceived desire for defeat of Ukrainian people inspired by Kremlin propaganda. Let me let me just take that one step further and even say, should there just be an acceptance that a portion of Ukraine is going to be annexed by Russia and allow Russia to get away with that? Well, I dispute the idea that armed struggle has to be part of any imperialism. I think it feeds the imperialists, the armed struggle, certainly both crassly, cravenly, and literally. I think assist, there are others in Ukraine. I'm on a weekly call with Russian women who have been involved with Ukrainian women who are seeking alternatives to ongoing war. Obviously, with each day, as more civilians are killed, mothers, children, utilities are bombed. It, it's harder and harder, of course. But there is a history of this country divided. Um, I think there are ways to work through. So it's not annexing land, uh, as your guest tomorrow asserts. But I'm, I'm not sure Ukraine is fully divided between this idea of armed resistance. You know, Zelensky, who's emerged as a major figure, obviously, and it's extraordinary to see because few people understood how he would emerge in the context of war, but he ran on a peace ticket. Peace ticket meaning to resolve the conflicts that have that were present in the Donbass region, Luhansk, Donetsk, uh, and he participated in trying before things exploded with the invasion, in trying to find a way to uh, reduce the conflict between the West and the East. You know, the East has been Russian speaking. Language rights emerged as a major issue in the first months of Poroshenko, the previous prime minister's tenure. And there was an attempt to kind of, anyway, there have been attempts, but the idea that Zelensky ran as a peace candidate but of course had to transform himself and he has in powerful ways. Um, but your guest tomorrow, that is one way of thinking about it. There are allusions to the Spanish civil war, for example. I was going to ask that. Yeah. I mean, because we know, lament think, today that we, the United States did not support the Spanish Republic. But I think that was, I think one of the problems we have, Mitch, is lessons of history. Lessons of history are critical. The Cuban Missile Crisis is different than today, but one can draw lessons. But the lesson so many establishment policymakers and others return to is appeasement, 36, 37, 38, Hitler, Neville Chamberlain. This is more reminiscent, according to some serious scholars, of 19, 1914, uh, even the turn of the century, geopolitical conflict. But the rush to kind of frame it as I suggested earlier, is is not helpful in terms of thinking through or resolving. Um, of course, people feel for, you You know, you want to be helpful and be there for Ukrainians, but it's, I'm not sure armed weapons is the way. Uh, we better stand with Ukrainians when there is a final kind of resolution, 
Zelensky has said the country will need, I believe, is it $7 billion a month? And the numbers being suggested are very tough. And I think demand a cold eyed realism, which is not about abandoning Ukraine, but our weapons, 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 weapons. The, let's have a similar, at least a, a what's it, a track two of as much energy being put into the training, the escalation of weapons, the intelligence, as into finding a diplomatic resol resolution. Usually before there is a diplomatic resolution, I want to get to callers as soon as I can because our lines are full, as you can imagine. But it, before getting to isn't it normal before you get to a diplomatic solution to actually escalate so that but, you are What have we been doing for the last potential? months, Mitch? I mean, the, we've, we've escalated to a point which is a high point, right? I mean, you could argue that the idea, which is certainly an idea, that you arm yourself so that you're at a better place at a negotiating table. I think we're there. I mean, the more weapons poured in, you're heading into winter, which is, you know, an issue. It's both an issue, issue in Europe, but it's an issue, very, very deep issue in Ukraine, Russia. So you may see, a, a, you know, a stasis that there's nothing moving for months, but come out of that into more weapons and more escalation, maybe the winner becomes, as opposed to defeat of Napoleon, it becomes known as a time when people put down their arms and with the assistance of an outside community, which is respectful of Ukraine's needs and demands, begins some talk. That would be the best hope because the slog, the attrition, the deaths that are likely to be even more brutal in winter to be avoided at all at, as possible. Let's go to our first caller, and we'll begin in Oakland, where we're joined by Delphine. Good morning, Delphine. You're on the air. Good morning. Um, I have two questions. Number one, how much money is being funneled right back into American weapons manufacturers? All the money that we're giving towards it, is it just being funneled right back into the U.S.? Number two... Um, did we not agree that we would not put any more weapons on Russian borders? Wasn't that one of our agreements during the Cuban Missile Conflict? That's Thank it. you, Delphine. Um, just to take the second question first, no, but uh, that was not, the agreement was that the United States took missiles out of Turkey, Jupiter missiles. Um, NATO expansion and the placement of anti-defense uh, military equipment. NATO expansion in many ways was um, a violation, not only of the agreement with Gorbachev, not one inch eastward after German reunification, but in the last years, it's moved up to the borders of the former Soviet Union, Russia. And in that context, there are US weapons, European weapons on the border. Um, and the question of money coming back, well, People are making a lot of money on this war. Uh, in fact, there are, you know, we have not, we have ex expanded to the point where there's now a rush on manufacturing because there isn't adequate military equipment. But there are people making billions and billions of dollars that could go toward rebuilding Ukraine. I do believe Mitch's question is relevant, but that there, has been enough escalation and Ukraine has shown its mettle on the battlefield to a point where you could go to a table uh, for negotiations with Ukraine having a strong hand. Uh, but the money piece could be used in so many more productive ways in terms of the world's interests and needs. A couple of comments online on our YouTube page where we are streaming this live. MK946 writes, it is unfortunate that Ukraine is caught between two centers of capital, Russian state olig oligarchy and Western neoliberal institutions like World Bank and IMF that require Ukraine's destruction. And then John Prester writes this, and this was about Zelensky, and I've heard this before from the left, some on the left saying Zelensky didn't run, he was installed. Don't insult the intellect of, of the audience. Uh, there you is know, he the, the leader after... There was, you could you could talk about a coup in 2014 after Maidan when Victoria Newland, Jeffrey Piat uh, were caught on a call, Victoria Newland saying F-U-C-K, forgive me, the EU, 
showing that America believed it was in the proconsul position of erecting a government it liked. There was an inter there was a leader after that called uh, Poroshenko, who was the chocolate oligarch. Now he may well have been installed, but there was an election which is a, was you know semi fair. And Zelensky was, you know what he was, watch the HBO. I mean, he was dancing with the stars. He was the Paddington Bear voiceover. He was um, an actor. He was, you know, he was a humorist. He was on Russia's famous reality show, Kvartal, I think, 49 or one. Of, but he's risen, as so many do, sadly, in times of war. We wish more in times of peace. But it is the case that he represented a point of view about trying to find a resolution of the ongoing conflict that, by the way, did not begin February 24th, 2021. It began in 2013, 2014. Poroshenko sent troops to the eastern part of Ukraine to kill, quote, terrorists, fellow Ukrainians. So I'm just, it, there's a history over the last decade. Uh, but I don't think Zelensky's weakness is that it was a rigged election. I think the weakness is that he has, because of the R Russian aggression, has had to find a different modus operandi in his country. But I do think there have been possibilities of off-ramp negotiations that I mentioned that have been blitzed away and that need to, pushed away, need to be re uh, reinstated. Our next caller is Joseph in Berkeley. Good morning, Joseph, you're on the air. Yes, good morning. Um, thank you very much for opening up the phone lines on this, uh, um, Mitch, because uh, really the only dissent and the best argument that you hear against this U.S. Uh, war is from uh, uh, people, from progressives, not only progressives, but from people in the public. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we've been hearing all these Cold War liberals, like those from the Quincy Institute, come and uh, misguide the public about the true nature of this war. Uh, Chris Hedges agreed with me when he was recently in uh, Berkeley that the, the entire reason for this war, the entire reason for the expansion of NATO, when there is no more Warsaw Pact, there is no more Eastern Bloc, there is no more Soviet Union, is to once again hugely feed the military industrial complex, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. That is the entire reason for this war. That is the entire reason for provoking Is Russia. that why Russia invaded Ukraine? The, I was just about to mention that. That was the entire reason that Russia has been provoked into this war. You don't have to like or dislike Putin to understand that. It was provoked in this war by the steady expansion of NATO. Uh, uh, Russia, Putin waited patiently for many years to when he protested this expansion, and now that it's reached an existential threat from the perception of the Russians, which the late Stephen Cohen uh, certainly understood, and I sorely and many people sorely miss him, uh, this is the reason that this is happening. And the people of the world have been immiserated. Gas prices in the United States have been skyrocketing. Inflation is rampant. This is how we Americans and other people in the war in the world, the public, are paying for this war. Besides, the tri besides this being another trillion dollar war that is being taken from our uh, treasury, and the military industrial complex is largely composed of the one percent. And for the one percent, war is always big business. Jeffrey Sachs okay, was Joseph, the first Joseph, person yeah. on the, the war, No, we, we got, we got thank the you, Jeffrey. Here. I was going to say I sorely miss Stephen Cohen as well. And his last book, uh, my late husband, his last book was War with Russia? Question mark. I would disagree to the extent that NATO, I think, is a central factor, but there are other factors too. The um, the cold warriors have been ascendant inside the Democratic Party and you know in other parties, and I think that the uh, the tr how to put it, there have been so many missteps and there have been so many adversarial relationships now between the United States and Russia. And think of the fact that we have a national security strategy, which uh, tr Biden has just unveiled, which is essentially, you know, a Cold War document. It's that Russia's an adversary, China's an adversary, as opposed to saying, 
this would be before the war, but Russia, we need collaboration on some of the crises, existential crises of our time. So I do think the military industrial complex, but I also think that there are cold warriors in our politics who have never gone away. And as I mentioned earlier, neoliberal interventionists, neocon interventionists, and they see dealing with, quote, threats through military means. Um, I think NATO is a major factor, but there are people who've studied Russia for decades who, and by the way, the Quincy Institute is not full of, I mean, you had someone like Anatole Levin who's been attacked for being, trying to understand, not condone, but he was, people were stunned by the uh, invasion of February 24th. They really believed that Russia had a case, the NATO expansion and other factors, but through the going into Ukraine, it became a different framework for a while, but now, and I admire Chris Hedges, I agree with him, but it's more, there's more to it, I think. Certainly NATO is a major, major factor, but at this stage, there's a clash that reaches beyond NATO. And Chris Hedges, just to be clear, we had him on not too long ago, did say he thought that it was uh, that Putin had committed a war crime yeah. by invading Ukraine. By invading. I mean, at the same time, as I've tried to say, the, how to rebuild security is not necessarily about escalating weapons. I mean, I wrote about someone Steve and I came to know well was Gorbachev, who gave a visionary. He was a visionary. He was the most committed abolitionist of nuclear weapons ever to lead a major nuclear country. He had a vision. It was a realistic vision, as your guest just or your Colin just said. The Warsaw Pact disappeared. Why did NATO continue to expand? He had a vision of a Europe whole and free, a completely different security architecture from Vladivostok to Lisbon. It would not have been, it would have been a demilitarized zone. Instead, we get a NATO, which is not a coffee clash. It's a military institution, which ramps up profits for the weapons companies. And I guess it's just what makes this so difficult on the left is, I think there is a recognition that NATO is, and NATO expansion is, is a part of this dynamic. However, that does not justify invading Ukraine Russia has now invaded Ukraine, looking to annex further parts of Ukraine. And what what do you do about it? Do you, do you just allow that to occur? No, I think, listen, Crimea is a complicated, Crimea, listen, I think it was Edward Said who spoke about frozen, I mean, frozen conflicts, historic conflicts that are frozen in time. This world lives with some of them. Kashmir, I think, or, you know, lo looking at many parts, um, I think Crimea has to be part of an international referenda if it, we ever get back to that footing. And I think the Minsk Accords, which I ask your listeners to go read up on, had a way of resolving the Donetsk, Luhansk, Donbass region issue. Everything is now both new, but also returned to some of the factors that were in play before the war. And not a... <laughs> It's not appeasement, it's trying to find a resolution that will leave a Ukraine whole and free and begin to end the killings. The killings go on, go on, and it's not clear what the goal is. We've been in wars like this where it's the fog of war. There's a brutality and a horror that is clear, by the way, to the mothers in Ukraine and in Russia who are welcoming back zinc coffins as the great Nobel literature writer uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich of, from Belarus writes about in her book, Zinky Boys or Secondhand Time. I mean, there's a humanity that is hard to associate with the barbarism of this war, but the barbarism, there's barbarism beginning with the aggressor, but in war, there's barbarism on all sides. It's the nature. We don't hear as much because a lot of our reporting, some of it's very good, but much of it is sourced from Ukrainian sources. And I think that has to be acknowledged, that there's a brutality, certainly from the aggressor launching the war, but now in this cauldron, there's a brutality of all forces in this cauldron. And I think we need to find a way out of that, a break. Uh, and as I've said, there have been barbaric wars and struggles before, and there's a possibility if there's a will. 
Let's next go down to Los Angeles, listening to KPFK. John, John, good morning. You're on the air with Katrina Vanden Heuvel. I'd like to know about the possible implications or influence of uh, invasions of uh, of Russia, starting from like, from the Mongols and then the Kingdom of Sweden and then Napoleon and the, the French and then in 1919 the United States tried to attack uh, Leninist the Bolsheviks out of out of the Arctic Circle. There was uh, banking for the support for the Nazis in in Germany. Then World War II and the 26 or 20 to 30 million Russians who died. And then after that, the B-52s loaded with H-bombs heading in a, in a continuing circling yeah. measurements heading towards Moscow. So All right. what, what is There's a long history. The let me, Thanks, John. Let me, John, let me pick up, if I might, just on a piece of that. You know, there's a long history of Western intervention in Russia. I'm thinking particularly of 1917 to 1921 when the white forces, the British, the United States, intervened. You know, the Russian Revolution, think of it what you will, never had a chance in a sense because it merged into a civil war and became militarized because of the invading forces. Uh, there's a long history. I was just in Europe. And something that I think in this country is not understood, and you know, I say it and then we can think about what it means, but 27 million Russians died in World War II. Steve Ambrose, the professor who set up the World War II Museum in New Orleans, Steve and I used to get mailings from Tom Hanks, Steve Spielberg about World War II, and it was as if the Red Army loped by, just happened to be in the neighborhood. And I think that factor of World War II can't be dismissed because it's the only unifying thing in Russia today, in a sense. Marshal Zhukov, not Stalin, is the unifying figure. Putin may manipulate World War II at times. His brother died, I think, in the uh, siege of Leningrad. But it's an important history, and the intervention into Russia is important. That isn't that Russia didn't intervene in other countries, didn't intervene in other countries, but um, there is a history that has to be understood. And one of the members of the American Committee on US-Russia Accord is a woman named Marlene Laruel, who's an expert on the intervention into Russia and the imp impact on its politics. Let's next go to Mark, who is in Berkeley. Hello, Mark, you're on the air. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mitch. Uh, I want to thank the guests for her uh, column in the uh, nation way back in the beginning of March uh, to be the first sane voice in this dark tunnel of corporate lockstep media. Um, I just want to say that I, I do believe that the entire um, Ukrainian uh, episode since the Maidan uh, has been instigated and supplied, supported by the U.S. NATO interests. Um, I, I do believe they had goals, uh, rolling back the European Union, which we had moved ahead of the American economy, uh, selling expensive American fracked oil. And I do believe uh, weakening Russia for the next Syrian adventure, which I believe is on the ground right now and, 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 and beginning. So, um, and Mitch, I just wanted to say that uh, I didn't support, I'm not a Putin fan or the Russian nuclear state, but... Uh, um, I do believe uh, when the Russians did invade in March, there was evidence, solid evidence of a huge weapons buildup. Uh, we were seeing it over here, Biden, Johnson, just sending all kinds of weapons. And there was a big buildup. And in the military mind, uh, you just don't let that happen. There was a fear that it was going to go through the Donbass. That war was nasty for six years. You never heard about it. Uh, and there was a fear they were going to go into Russia. So there were, there were interests and security interests all around. Um, uh, so I do think that we should see the whole adventure in terms of the interests that are benefiting. I'll take a response. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. your, your caller makes an important point, but I'd step back and say, I think in this country since the end of World War II, before, uh, but in the first Cold War, you had two competing theories. One was containment. The other was rollback. And I think rollback has won out at the moment in the context of US foreign policy, where you have, the, I forget which general kind of, where a gaffe is really the truth, spoke about you know, t bringing Russia down, about regime change in Russia. And I think that may be a goal, which is far beyond defense of Ukraine as a sovereign 
independent country. That has been on the planner's books for years and years. And there is kind of a sense uh, that that is, you know, renewed. Um, I remember in the 50s during the McCarthy period, which was my area of study, watching films of parades in New York City of the captive nations. The captive nations being the Baltics, Ukraine, Eastern Europe. And I think there's a sensibility now in the kind of depiction of Russia as an aggressive force uh, that they need defense. And they're seeking defense and they have powerful constituencies in this country often aligned with defense companies. This is not popular uh, to say this, but there, you know, do you remember Donald Rumsfeld during Iraq where he spoke of old Europe and new Europe? You know, there is a divide. And by the way, the idea that this war is gonna make Europe coherent and independent and powerful, Europe is dividing in ways that feed the Rumsfeld craziness. Uh, in any case, there's a tragedy here, but um, we need to return, it seems to me, to a containment that is both for US security, but also allows nations to be free and independent. But the military, the militarization, and I'll end here, your caller is right that the cost of it, not just the cost of war in human terms, but the cost of war in casting out other ways of living and feeding the beast of cost of military equipment really sap, I think, the possibility. On our YouTube stream, Pacheco Roan asks, what is your view of the attacks on the Nord Stream pipelines? Yeah. A lot of speculation. Very, very dangerous. I, you know, I don't know their interests at play. You can look at those interests and kind of try to factor in uh, but it's going to, you're, as I said, Europe is reeling. Stores, small stores are closing in Germany and the Netherlands. Britain is a disaster. Energy costs are increasing. Bills are increasing. So I think that is the factor to pay attention to. And what, sadly, I think those who believe cl the climate crisis is our major challenge, we're witnessing a rollback, a regression in Europe around the green issue. I mean, when did nuclear power become a green power source. You know, these are serious. How do we rebuild a climate movement in the context of war and shortages and anger? Um, is But Nord Stream... There, there is a lot of speculation who did it. Well, who did, did it? There's a lot itself? of speculation. Was the United States but we know it? Is it, it, we know it escalated the war, just as, by the way, the killing of the right-wing philosopher's daughter, Dugana, in August was an escalation. So their interventions, who done it, et cetera. We do know now, by the way, that it, the U.S. government leaked that the Ukrainians were responsible for Dugana's killing. And I wonder if that was a preemptive move so as to distance itself, the United States, from the bombing of the Kirsch Bridge, which links the mainland and Crimea, because that, too, moved Putin provoked Putin or, you know, to bomb Kiev. I mean, it was an escalation. And so these, there are forces in any conflict. There's a history on the eve of, say, a diplomatic meeting of subversion by violence or military means to avert that diplomatic possibility. I mean, it's interesting, right? The time of war, right? There, there are people out there that firmly believe the United States was behind both the bombing of the bridge and uh, or Ukraine. Was, well, yeah, the here's the problem, the Mitch. And then the problem is Russia it's become a proxy it, I, war. I mean, I guess the point I want to say is I, I don't know what to believe. The fog of war is so overshadowing. But what we do know is it's an escalation. I mean, it's a it's a and what we you know, it, it's um, it's hard to know. But I do think what's dangerous is that the United States is all over the escalation and not just the escalation, the stories that are being reported about the U.S. offering intelligence guidance, which, by the way, the Ukraine doesn't have that capacity. Maybe it's developing it in the context of this brutal war, but the United States has enabled. And, you know, it's hard. The problem is that at some point, the United States, I don't know, will feel Look at, you know, there is already a kind of impatience with the money. At some point, the United States will not 
be doing what it's doing every day. And at that point, Russia, you know, does have more overwhelming might. So you have an endless war. I think the endless war idea is a terrible one, but you have to, it's, it's so complicated. And I wish I was more, how to say, just raw, you know, just new, as you just suggested, Mitch, it's hard to know. It's a complicated situation. It's I mean, not, yeah. Iraq in my mind was a disaster, you know, just from the get-go, the nation was, I think one of the few liberal places, progressive left, just no, this is a disaster. Now everyone says what a disaster, you know, but this is a disaster. And I do believe that there is a history of responsibility the United States bears, but it, in the last few years, it's been more complicated. And in the last year with the Russian invasion, it's more and more and more complicated. We're down to our final 30 seconds, but I, the point I was really trying to hit there is on the left, when we talk about this divide in the left on the situation, you have people who are very sure that the bombing of the pipelines was done by Russia, and on the other side, very sure that the bombing was done by the United States or, or, or Ukraine. And to, to me, it's like, I, I have no idea. I don't know what to believe. What I am sure about, Mitch, though, and it's hard to say because it's such a horrifying time and war but that if this war goes on the escalation may lead to a nuclear conflict it will lead to more dying and as i said earlier we don't have a good track record of being there when the war ends and a country needs to be reconstructed and so i i just think the sooner there can be an off-ramp the more important well, I, we have the tyranny of the clock in broadcasting, and it is now imposing its will. We do have to wrap it up there. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, publisher of The Nation magazine, thank you for doing this with us today. Thank you. And that does it for Letters and Politics. The show is produced by Deanna Martinez. Kirsten Thomas is our engineer. I'm Mitch Jezrich, and I thank you for listening.